Hey, so the hand, you're real, ready to roll. So good to see you. All right, so how many of you have been, have been to a place that nothing's familiar? Nothing, I mean zero, right? I was, uh, when I first arrived in 19, I know it sounds weird, it sounds like I'm ancient, but 1975, I arrived in Japan, right? And I was just like, I couldn't read any of the signs. I didn't understand anything anything was saying. And the moment I spoke to speak to someone, they just look at me and walk away. And I was like, okay. So I lived in Yokosuka, Japan for four years. And I had to learn, or I had to unlearn everything I was familiar with. Nothing was the same. When you walk to it, you knock on a door, and they open the door, what are you supposed to do first? We go, hi, right? And reach out your hand. They just look at your hand. You reach out your hand, they look at it. They don't shake hands. What do they do? They bow. So when you first come to the door, when they open the door, they, you have to first, you, they stand there and look at you. And you're supposed to bow first. If you don't bow first, you, they, they, you don't exist. Once you bow to the house, which is weird, then you bow to the man. And then he introduces his wife, then you bow to her. Now, then you walk in, you gotta take off your shoes. I'm not used to that. I went right now on, stopping on top of the tummy mat, and they're like, ah! <laughs> Point to my feet, I go, what? I sit on some, step on something, or what? <laughs> Come off. So I had to learn all these cultures, I, especially when you go to dinner. Where's the forks? Where's the knife? There isn't any. All you get is two pieces of sticks. They're about this long, and you put them between your fingers, and that's what you eat with. Can I have a fork? <laughs> Can I have a fork? They don't got no forks. They got spoons. That's it. So what do you do? And how long did it take me to become orientated to that? Four years, just as I was leaving. I finally got it. It's so hard because once we're, we don't even, we do things without thinking about it. We act without thinking because we're accustomed to it. But when everything you do, you have to think before you do it. It's very tiring. Is that making sense? Now, what we're going to cover is what happened during the time of when the Bible came out. All right? Now, this is important when we go to the King James Version or any other version after it. Same problem, okay? So I'm going to try and explain it. So that we, now the Reign of Valera is a mere copy of the King James. It's not too. It's pretty good. But when you talk about where the Reign of Valera come from, Reign of Valera came from the King James. What did the Spanish use before the Reign of Valera? Because that didn't happen in the 1960s. What was there? The Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate. That's what this is. The Latin Vulgate is the worst Bible ever. The Old Testament, not a single Jew will look at the Old Testament and say, that's not, that's not scripture. It was never accepted. So there's a real problem going from one culture to another. Living in the East, there's some major changes that has to be adapted. So we're going to get into this, right? What preceded and what caused the King James Bible to come into being, which then later on the reign of Valera. What happened? What caused it? How many already know this? Nobody? Okay, where are you going to find out? And I'm going to show you, introduce you a person you may never heard of before. His name is William Tyndale. And I have his works right here. So Tyndale's works is pretty impressive. But I'm going to explain a little bit about him. So Heavenly Father, thank you right now for helping me to teach the great greatness of your word and the history that brought to pass how you oversaw and brought to pass every aspect so that your people can truly be more than conquerors in every challenge. That they can go to you for answers, direction, and make the right decisions so that they can be blessed, they can have health and prosperity, and truly glorify you walking within your shadow and in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead, our risen and returned Lord Jesus, your anointed. Okay. Now, I'm going to step you through, I'm going to take a little slice of history, 
and maybe you know of it, maybe you don't. But basically, I'm going to take you back in time to around the, the early 16th century, 15, 1536, I think it was. And we're talking about the challenges of translation. All right, so here's the statement. Tyndale was at, was trying to talk to some clergymen, Roman Catholic priests and bishops, and he was telling them that, which is, you know, that the Word of God is priority over the religion, over the ritual, over the Roman Catholic stuff. And the priest responded, we had better be without God's laws than without the Pope's laws. So the Pope was more valuable than God. Now, being a former Roman Catholic, I understand that because I, I really believed the Pope was invaluable. I really believed, because that's what I was taught, that he was Jesus on earth, and that Jesus is God and Mary is the mother of God, and so on and so on, right? That's what I believed. Was I right? No, I was terribly wrong. But I didn't know the word, and all I had was my traditions and the religion that I was taught. So we, have better, we are better without God's laws than being without the popes. And he responded, Tyndale responded, I defy the pope and all his laws. And if God spares my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou knowest. That's pretty bold. Now he became what's called a heretic and sentenced to death. So... The situation is people say, oh, you don't understand how hard it is to believe God's word. Well, if you go back to the 1520s, if you didn't, you think it was hard then. If you said anything that counted the Roman Catholic Church, you were put to death. How many of you ever heard of the Inquisition? The Spanish Inquisition? What was it all about? Why were men, women, and children killed by the Roman Catholic Church? Whole villages were, were all, everyone was killed and the, the whole town was burnt to the ground. Why? What was the deal? We don't even know. How many of you have ever been to the Inquisition exhibitions? Where they show you the, the, the um, Inquisition uh, tools. They're pretty terrible. So, but we have a very short memory about what happened. So, the Bible was taboo. The Roman Catholic Church had declared if you touched it or found with it and you were reading it, you were put to death. That's how intense it was. People said, well, I'm a Roman Catholic. Well, okay. So when I have that book and I, I've talked to bishops and archbishops, and, and the problem that occurs is they look at that as a holy relic. You're not supposed to read it. You understand? Kind of like what the Constitution has become, a holy relic. You're not supposed to read it. So what happened to him after he made this statement? He became outlawed. He became a heretic. He became, the penalty for that is death. Well, it's not like the electric chair or anything like that. It's standard Catholic way of terminating your life. By the way, the Inquisition didn't die down until 1925. The Inquisition was still in progress. So it wasn't that long ago. That's not what happened. Well, he was sentenced to death, and just as before they executed him, he called out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Now, why was he being put to death? The King of England authorized him to be put to death, along with Charles V, was the uh, Holy Roman Empire at that time. This is, by the way, this all right now is all happening right after this Columbus discovered America, about the same time, it's called the Renaissance. And this is what they did to him. Now, most people were burned alive, but he was strangled first and then, which broke his neck, then they burned him alive, then they burned him. Most everybody else, the Roman Catholic Church just burned him and 
despite all the screams, which is not much different than Nero did during the Roman. The Roman Empire has not died. It's still alive and well in the Roman Catholic Church. All right. So, Frank, this is morbid. No, it's history. Oh, I'm offended by it. Well, if you're offended by it, you understand the Bible is not made for good times. It's made for what? Show me one place in the Bible where there's good times. You ever notice that light shines brightest when it's the darkest? God comes through not to help you find a parking place, but to save your life. If you listen, if you can hear. Now, the problem was why did Tyndale die and Martin Luther not? And this is what I was confused about. I'm going to explain what happened. First of all, after the fall of Byzantium, which is Constantinople, when it fell, all the people from the east that were there, the manuscripts from Ephesus, which is when you read the book of Ephesus, that's where the, the, all the manuscripts came from, was taken from there to the Netherlands and put in his hands to review. That was like 50-some years later. And he's like, because he's a Roman Catholic. He'd never seen this stuff before. He didn't know it existed. So he studied it, and he had two students. Martin Luther and Tyndale. There's another person here. There's several others, and Zinguili, and there's a whole bunch. But right now, rather than covering all of the reformers, I just want to cover Luther and Tyndale. Luther came under the attack of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles, Charles V. And Tyndale came under, the, under attack by the king, uh, Henry VIII, right? Okay, so what happened? This is King Henry VIII. Not really, it's his picture. I know it looks, it's not him, it's his picture of him. He wasn't that big. He was, you know, pretty good-sized man, right? I know he looks small, but he's not. He's a good guy. All right, but anyway, <laughs> so what he did is that him being a, a, um, a protector of the Roman Catholic Church, being a king, that was his requirement. Now, understand a king became a king by the graces or the blessings of who? The Catholic Pope. The Pope put the king in charge. Well, when the reformers started, Erasmus, Tyndale, Luther started teaching what the scripture said that came from Ephesus, they became outlaws, and him being in England was, was a real nightmare. And so the Pope was like saying, you either get rid of him, and he told Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, you get rid of Luther, or you're no longer king. I remove my coronation from you. You'll be excommunicated. Like, whoa, no king wants that to happen. So that you can understand what happened. These guys are trying to keep their what? Positions, their authority and power. And everybody's always challenged when their authority is at stake. They always get they always get ag ag aggressive and attacking. So what happened? Well, from his position, Tyndale wrote, and when after he died after he was killed, he was being ready to be excommunicated by the Pope. The Pope said, I've had it with you, and I'm going to remove you, and I'm going to put the whole land of England under Spain or under France. And Henry was like, uh, no, you're not. He goes, yeah, you're going down. So what he did is he pissed off even more, and he put to death because of Englishmen that were put to death, he put some Roman Catholics to death. <laughs> kind of like, you know, you hurt my people, I'll hurt your people, that kind of thing. Now understand, England was, because of Mary, um, Mary of Scots, England was half Catholic and half Protestant. Protestant means I live by the word of God, I protest the Roman Catholic Church, because that's all there was is the Roman Catholic Church. Does that make sense? Okay, so he's got a real problem because he can't, He's under the thumb of the Pope, and he can't go anywhere. He can't do anything without their authorization. So 
what was interesting is the fact that Tyndale did all these translations, his first works, which was like 70% of the Bible. That's as far as he got. He didn't get a chance to translate the rest of it. But he did a magnificent job, and, and he was only using the Koine Greek and the Hebrew. He did not go to the Latin at all. And he wrote the first book, Tyndale's first book. And that became the Great Bible, which the King James finally used. Is that interesting? I think, that, I think that's pretty cool. So the Coverdale Bible is the last, the, uh, Coverdale was the assistant to Tyndale, and he put the rest of it together and, so, and did the translation for the last part of it. And that became the Coverdale Bible, which became the King's Bible. King died, and his son died, and then we have Elizabeth I. Why do they call her Elizabeth I? That's right. She's the first one. Okay. <laughs> now, she's the first Protestant. Her sister was Catholic, right? But she's the first Protestant. She came in as a Protestant, but the problem was there was no, this Bible as, you know, as, as awesome as it is, people had a hard time reading it because what they were accustomed and what it said did not match. So people, rather than trying to match the word, just put away the Bible. They just wouldn't read it. See the problem? How many of you read the Bible and said, oops, I'm not doing that, but that's okay. I'm, I'm going to stop reading it for a while. Yes. You, see, you see the problem? Yes. Well, England was like that because what was all of England? England was what? Roman Catholic. They were all raised Roman Catholics. So Elizabeth had this, she was, she came in to be Protestant. She was raised a Protestant, Protestant on the scriptures from, I guess, what, 16, no, 12? She learned the scriptures and she read the Bible. So she became the Virgin Mary or Virgin Queen of England. So she became the first Protestant and she tried to be just like Holy Mary. Where did she get that from? There's nothing in there about Holy Mary. But that she was her culture is Roman Catholic. So that continued until she died. And guess who this is? You see? Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, and King James. That's right, he's King James. Now King James was a Scottish king of Scotland became the king of the empire, English empire. When he did, he was like, well, you know what? I need to get everybody all together so we're all on the same page. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to get this Bible so that everybody can read it. We're going, to re we're going to take it and work it together. So what he did is that he commanded that, that this gentleman right here, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Richard Bancar, he, being a very good, brought up a good, solid Roman Catholic, was going to assemble 57 European scholars, the best in the world. And they were going to each divide up into six parts, and each part was going to take a Bible. You ever notice that when you're, doing, when you're actually working the Word, it sounds like seven different, you know, like all these different people wrote, different people translated it? It's because, yeah, many people translated it. God, it wasn't one person. People say, well, I only live by the King James Bible. You have no idea what, what's going on here. How hard it was to even get that done. His persecution as a king almost cost him the crown. The Roman Catholics in his nation almost killed him because they considered it sacrilege. So the intrigue, I mean, there's a movie that's called, talk about hit her being the first Protestant, how many Spain, the Pope sent out assassins to take her out and assassins to kill her at court. It's, it's interesting when you look at all her relatives, how they all died in unique situations. So a lot of these people died because they were assassinated. Roman Catholic Church proceeded to take them all out because they were having people r read the Bible rather than listen to the Pope. And whenever someone threatens someone with power, there is a retaliation. So Archbishop of Canterbury, Richard Bancroft, 
So it's together, and it got 57 of the top European experts. Anyone from the Middle East? Anyone from the Eastern culture? Nope. Zero. Did they understand half of what they're translating? Nope. All right, let's give you an example. Everybody grab your Bibles really quick. I'm going to show you one of the translations. Now I want you to tell me what you think of their workmanship. And in the Song of Solomon, Cantelis, let's go there. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Everybody there? Yes. All right. Okay, ladies, pretend this is some guy speaking to you, okay? Chapter 7. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hand of a cunning workman. Thy navel is like a round goblet. All right, how many would feel? Do you see there's a problem with the translation? Is anyone noticing this? Mm. Which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Now imagine your husband telling you that. <laughs> you see a problem here. This is a cultural thing. The terminologies are all Eastern. There's, they don't, they, when they translate this like, this doesn't make any sense. It wasn't the only place. There's lots of places that they were scared to even do the translation because they already had beliefs that weren't true. But anyway, thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Thy neck is as a tower of ivory. Wow, well, that's a big neck. Thy eyes are like fish pools in the Hassan by the gates of Bath Rabbim. Thy nose as the Tower of Lebanon. Just look at toward that's a big nose. <laughs> that's a big nose. Thy head upon thee is like caramel. Well, how many would like to have a head like caramel? And the hair of thine head like purple. Now, people, that's no problem today. A lot of people have purple hair. That's not what I was talking about. <laughs> but, but that's how they translate it. The king is held in his galleries. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love, for delights. Thy stature is like a palm tree. Thy breasts two clusters of grapes. Wow, that's intense. How many women would find that a compliment? I think not. <laughs> the translators didn't know what to do with that. Same problem they have with the whole Bible. It's not a Western book. It's, repeat after me. It's not a Western book. It's an Eastern book. All those terminologies, all Eastern. Have, we have no idea what the heck they're talking about because it's not our culture. All right. So Tyndale understood the Greek, but he didn't understand the usage of words. Erasmus was like totally confused as to what these things were. He knew Greek, but he didn't understand Corne because it's a mixture of Greek and what? Aramaic, right? Not Arabic, Aramaic. So kind of like here in, in San Diego, we got, we got, what do you call it? It's an English and Spanish mix. Spanglish, right? Because you go, I'll check a, please. I'll check a, right? Did you, did you drive here in El Truco? No, there's no such thing as El Truco, and there's no such thing as El Cheque. These things don't work. And the word OK, they, people don't say that outside of here. That's an American phrase. So there's a lot of things that it's a mixture of the two languages. Well, in the Bible culture, Aramaic was the standard, and then Alexander the Great forced Egyptian on top. So it's like the cake was Aramaic, but the icing was Greek. That makes sense? So what happened is you formed that middle layer between the icing and the cake, and that became Koine. So when he got this, he had to get the scholars that came from Constantinople, and they stayed with him and helped him understand the passages. And both Tyndale and Luther were all ears, along with the other refor reformers. So by the time we get to here, Coverdale's Bible, we have Queen Elizabeth 
Now, she was so empowered by the scriptures that as a woman, she was the queen of England, but she was also head of the army. And so when the Spanish Armada came to take out England and force it under the Pope, she was out there on the beach with the men in full armor and stood out there with the men to face down the Spanish Armada in armor. You understand, she was, she was so amazing that she had no fear and she was able to stand. I think there's a few movies about her, Queen Elizabeth I, if you get a chance to watch it. Huh? It's called Elizabeth? Yeah. But she went through hell. But she, she, was, she was the Queen of England, so she had to, this is what's required, this is what I will do. And that's what she did. Exactly. Well, she didn't start it. He did. And that's why he needed something to base his new religion on. And that's why you have the, the uh, Coverdale Bible, which was Tyndale's work, the one he sent to death. He needed it like now. Because the Pope was going to excommunicate him and he would no longer be king. And the people of England would no longer follow him. Remember, it's half and half. That's why Israel, not Israel, but Ireland, I mean, you know, the country called Ireland? What's the north part of the island? Protestant. What's the southern part? Catholic. The battle's still going on. The IRA army fights all the time. So nothing has changed since this time. The fights and divisions and the English Empire is still dominant. But nonetheless, to form the new Anglican Church, he needed something that was different from the Pope. So that's where the Coverdale Bible came in. And he had his own great Bible. But nonetheless, this, he started the new Anglican Church. Well, the Pope is in charge of the Roman Catholic Church. Who's in charge of the Anglican Church? So when he died, then who was in charge? She became the head of the Anglican Church. You might call her the first pope, female. Did the pope, did the pope in Rome try to assassinate her? Yeah, like thousands of times. Did she take out, did he take out some of her people? Yeah. And the war began, and the war did not stop until the Armada showed up, and then Spain and England continued to fight for 300 years. Is it still going on today? Yes, it's still going on today. The Jesuit priesthood is trying to kill and wipe out the Protestant religions, still today. They have produced over 20 different variations of Bibles that go away from the King James and the Stephen's text and move toward the Latin Vulgate. So all these other translations you see, they don't have the phrase, live by every word of God. They don't have that. It's not in any of their versions. So if you want to know if the Roman Catholic Church was behind it, look at Luke 4.4. If it doesn't have the words, every word of God, it's, it's written by the Roman Catholic. It's sponsored, paid for, financed by the Roman Catholic Church. Today, still today. So 57 European scholars, seven years, and this is how we got the King James was there later on. You also got the Reign of Valera, and that's what it looked like when it came out. That's the title page. Yes. Well, this one was printed by the Praying Press, too. Huh? It, it, it was already out for like 20 years. I even got some of the, my, my books I have are from that same Praying Press, which I, I have a came from the same printing press. I'm serious. I got books that were printed by the same printing press as the one that printed the Bible and the Coverdale Bible. Yeah. Not cheap, but, you know, got it. So isn't that, isn't that weird? And this battle is still going on today between the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. Are we Protestants? Are we, would you say we are Protestants? If we're not Catholics, then we're what? 
If we live by the word of God, then you're a Protestant. So all these people before you, like Tyndale and, and Luther, they all started to live by it. Not only know the word, but live by it. Did they make mistakes? Yeah, Zingwili really made mistakes. Luther made mistakes. But they were trying to not be Roman Catholics and conform to the word. Okay, so now let's go into where this overhangs, where we get these Roman Catholic beliefs overhang. Because when you look at these people, the 57 European scholars, what were they? Protestant or Roman Catholic? Roman Catholic. What was he? Roman Catholic. What were all of these before? Roman Catholic. You see the problem. And this, by the Roman Catholic Church, is called a relic. You shouldn't be reading it. It's, no, it's just a whole, it's, it's, it belongs, just, the way the Roman Catholic Church looks at it is that I'm a primitive Christian. All right, that's the term for me. I'm a primitive, I don't have a bone in my nose, but I'm, a, I'm what's called, a, I haven't grown to where I've accepted the greater advanced Roman Catholic Church. No, that's just a cover and copy of the Greek and Roman religions. It has nothing to do with the Bible. So, I had a bishop take the Bible out of my hand and throw it on the ground. And I'm like, don't do that. And I picked up my Bible. I said, that was very not thoughtful. You think breaking a mirror is bad news? <laughs> that was really bad. But anyway, so Matthew 27, 46, and 40, 45, and 46. All right, here we go. Ready for biblical research? Someone comes up to you and asks you, and they say to you, I don't understand this verse. What are you going to say? <laughs> Matthew 27, 45 through 46. You ready? Okay, here we go. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land and on to the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God forsake Christ? And if God did forsake Christ, what's going to keep God from forsaking you? You understand the problem? So how would you answer this? Did God really forsake Christ? What's the answer? If you know the answer, that no, then how does it work? How do you work it? Come on, biblical researchers, you can do it. Hi. Would you like me to step you through it? Yes. Okay, take notes. I don't care how much musical you are. Take notes, right? All right, first of all, this, these words, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, is not. Now understand, Jesus spoke what language? Estrangilo Aramaic. He spoke Aramaic. Specifically, Estrangilo Aramaic. All right. This is Aramaic. Not spelled right, but still it's Aramaic. All right. So, what was this line, Aramaic, originally? What was this line up here, Aramaic? The whole Bible was what? Aramaic. So, why did they translate all these words, and then when they get to this, they left it there? Don't you ever wonder about that? When you see these words that aren't English or Spanish, why are they in there? Why didn't they translate them? Because if they did, they would incur the wrath of the king or the pope. And they didn't want to do that because what was the penalty? Death. Okay. What's the problem with this? Because it goes against the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. There you go. Would you like to know what it really says? And why it's, so, why it's so intense? I mean, really, this is like... Okay. First of all, we know that this part, all of this used to be Aramaic, and they translated it except for this. And they go, that is to say. Why are they... Where does this come from? If they're going to translate it, they're going to translate all these words, why not translate these too? Why add this? That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church? 
on this part, they said that God, he, he took all our sin, so now God couldn't look at him anymore, and God forsook him. Like, what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. But that's what they teach. So when they got this, they go, oh, shit. That's, that's a French word. Okay. So you can't. <laughs> This causes major problems. Everybody give me an uh-oh, ready? Uh-oh, that's right, it's an uh-oh. So let's find out what the uh-oh is. Eli, how many know what Eli means? All right, there's uh, Eli is short for what? Elohim. The I at the end is Aramaic for what? My, right? Like, I wouldn't say my watch, I go my watch eye, watch eye. I put the I at the end, designated it belongs to me. It's my. So anytime you see an Aramaic word with an I at the end, it just means my. So he's saying, my God. Okay, I wrote it in English. There you go. My God. Now the next word is Lama. Well, there's no Aramaic word Lama. Now if you, if you go to the Aramaic Bible and you look at it, it doesn't say Lama. And that's Aramaic, so you use the Aramaic Bible, even the Saraic Bible, and it's, you find out it's not Lama. It's this word. Lamana. It's totally different. Because I understand the problem, because they mistook the, the sound of the E with the A, but, you know, happens. So it's Lamana. Now, what does Lamana mean? How many have ever lifted something? How many of you have ever seen that, the football players? You know, they, they, they're running really hard, and they got the football, and they make it to the end, and they go, yeah, thank you, right? And they say, yeah. They go, yes. They go, what else do they say? Yahoo. What's up? Well, what do they say in Spanish? When someone's playing soccer, and they, they hit the, the running, they're getting the goal, and they make it the goal, and they go, what? And they say, goal. <laughs> That's it. All right, whatever. I don't have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Sportsman, I am not, okay? So basically, in the Aramaic language, it's a cry of accomplishment or an end of carrying a great weight. Ah, or finally, you know, that kind of thing. You go, the mana. I go, got it? That's why it's hard to translate because it's not something that would be in normal manuscripts. Now we have this other word, shabak. It says sabak, but that's not, that's not an Aramaic word. The word really is shabak. That's just Latin spelling. All right, shabak. Now, the real problem with this is when you look at all the translations in English, they really messed it up. Now, I'm going to show you one of the translations. Here is shabak. In 1 Kings 1911, this is what was done by the Latin, and they just carried it over into the King James. And his what it says in the Latin, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which had not kissed him. That's the statue. I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed. What is he talking about? Well, if you had $20, and I took... A, I took 17 of it, what would you have left? Pardon? Three. You're all such mathematical geniuses, I know. All right. If you start off with 20 bucks, I take away 17, you have three. Okay. Now, the three that you have left haven't left you yet. You, they haven't forsaken you, nor have you forsaken them. It's what you have what? Left. It didn't leave. You still got it. It's what's left over. All right. That's the problem with the Latin translation. It took it right from the Latin. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching, which is why you get this word forsaken. I'll show you that. Now, the next one, Shabbat, the next place, translated by the Koine, they take this verse and it's exactly saying what this verse is, 
and the koine word they used is the word reserved. So now they translate here, reserved. The Latin translators called it left, but the koine translating from the Hebrew says it's reserved. Huh. So whatever it is, it's kind of like what's left and what's in what? Reserved. How many got, how many here drive a car? Nobody drives, okay, drive a car. What's in your trunk? <laughs> spare tire. Spare tire, right. <laughs> you don't have a spare tire in your trunk? I'm not sure. You're not sure? All right. Uh, it is? Okay. Thank you. I was like really concerned. Okay. So when, when, what is that tire in the trunk for? It's what? Spared. It's reserved. It's set aside. Got it? You didn't buy just one. You, you, when you bought the car, you got five tires with it, and you kept that one. It was the only one left after you put all the tires on. It was the one was left. It's in reserve. So that could be like the remnants of whatever? Yeah. Whatever is left. It's not that it left. The, the translator said, oh, forsaken. No. It's not what it means. It means what's left. Got it? So that's why. So what are the two words? All right. First of all, the koine translates it reserved. That's from the actual koine language. Look at that. They say it's the same thing as reserved. These are the people with the Holy Spirit. I would say this is more accurate than this. But if you want to use this, you can say it's left. But understand, it's as not used, set aside, spared, reserved. Got it? So we take these two words and we put it right there for Shabbat. Now the next one is Thani. Remember I told you about the end? The I? What does the I mean? No, it's mine. My Thani. No, anyway. <laughs> Thani is purpose. Right? This is what? This is the purpose. So it's my purpose. That's all it means. Thani, that's my purpose. Why are you, why is it so important to be a parent? It's my purpose. Thani. Right? Got it? It just means my purpose. So, we get rid of this. We're going to do a quick, say, my purpose or cause. And we're going to go, wham! How was that? Isn't that magical? Want to see it back again? No, no, okay. Right. So, we take the two words, left and reserved. It's one of these two. That's how we're using the Bible to interpret what? Itself. For my purpose and my cause, which I, there's many of the verses that still come out the same way. So we're all going way off in left field. All right, so next thing is, where did they get the idea that God forsook him? They got it from Psalms 22.1. And this is what the Roman Catholic Church had been teaching prior to the Coverdale Bible, prior that they've been teaching for 400 years. They said Jesus became sin. And, and they take this verse out of Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, isn't that cute? And they use that to justify what they wrote up here. Saying this is this. Now, I can understand how they got that from the Latin, but it does not say that in the Hebrew, and it does not say that in the Koine. So they're blowing smoke. All right, now how do I know this? Because this word... Forsake is not this word Shabbat, or can't you tell? It's not the same word. That's it right there. And what is this? Azab. Okay, is Azab the same thing as Shabbat? No. They're blowing smoke. Big smoke rings. So that's not the same word. What, where is this used? If we're going to let the Bible interpret itself, where should we go? Uses, how about its first usage in the Bible, right? Find out what this is. Is this like a good idea or should we grab a dictionary? No, we don't, don't need it. The Bible does the what? Translation, okay. So if we go to the Bible and look up the word azab, 
you know, in the Hebrew. Where is it at? Well, I guess where it's at. You will be surprised. It's in Genesis. Genesis 2.24. You ready for this? Therefore shall a man leave. his father and his mother, and shall cleave on, not cleave his wife, cleave unto his wife, not cleave her, cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Got it? Okay. So there, this word there is azab, and this word here is azab. So what, what does azab really mean? Is it forsaken? No. Because you don't, Leave, you don't forsake your mother when, when you fell in love and you married her. Did you forsake your parents? No. <laughs> you didn't forsake your parents. In fact, you spend more time taking care of them than you do anything before you did. Right? Does that make sense? <laughs> so here is forsaken, here is leave. Now watch this. At no time will my left hand leave my... You know, I, I, okay. <laughs> so watch. Now this gets interesting. If... If you are to forsake your father and your mother, is there a problem? They translate forsake, they translate leave, right? In Genesis 2.24, but here they say forsake. Why has thou forsaken me? That's not, this is all a bunch of crap. This has nothing to do with this at all, zero. So what, what's going on? Well, if you really look at this and, and, and just e examine it, are you supposed to leave or forsake your father and mother? Deuteronomy 5 and 6, the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and mother. How? By forsaking them? <laughs> Leaving them in the dust? No. Got it? So if you're supposed to, if you do, if, if, you, if this is the word of God, which it is, if this is the commandment of God, which it is, then you can't use this word. And you can't use this word. There to be, it's a totally different, how many of our, it's hard to understand the Hebrew and Greek because we don't live in that culture. How many of our flew on a plane? All right? Not on the plane, I mean inside of it. You know. oh. Yeehaw! No. <laughs> When you fly in a plane and, and you lose oxygen, not you, I mean the cabin loses pressure, what happens? The ears pop. Okay, that's true. I'm just saying, if you lose cabin pressure, what, what happens? How many have been in an airplane that lost cabin pressure? What falls down? <clears throat> what is it? Oxygen mask. Guess what's in it? Oxygen. Why? Why do you need to have oxygen? Because you're losing cabin pressure. You're not going to be able to breathe. You're going to that purple nose, purple lips, purple fingertips. How do I know that? I was in a pressure chamber, right? You get, you always have to keep looking at your fingertips. If your nails start turning blue, you know you're in trouble. All right, so, so what happens is, as the atmospheric pressure disappears, you can't breathe. You can't, because the, the pressure that your blood requires to be put, which is like, was it six pounds per square inch, has to be pushed against you just so you can absorb the oxygen. So you need to put a mask over your face that forces the air into your mouth and into your lungs to compensate for the lack of pressure. Is that making sense? Okay. So now you got three little mini people on the other side of you. And the mask come down. What do you do? Take care of them first and then yourself? Why? Why do you do yourself first? Yeah, the mask is dangling in front of you and they're sitting there playing with it, right? What do you do? All three, you and two other masks, not you, I mean the mask for you, and the mask for your, the many people come down. What do you do? You put it on who first? Yourself. Why don't you put it on them first? Because you're not going to make it. You won't make it to the second child. You understand? Now, they, they're little. They can hold off a little bit longer than you. But nonetheless, you need to put it on yourself so you can take care of them. Because if you're passed out, how are you going to help them? So this is what it's talking about, forsaking. It's, this word, azab, 
has a tendency to say, not that you don't care about them, but you need to take care of yourself first so that you can do a better job. Is that making sense? If you don't take care of yourself first, then you're not going to be able to be much of an assistant. And people do that. They burn themselves out, and that's not according to the word. You're supposed to pr protect yourself so that you can continue to provide. Got it? See the difference? That's what this is talking about. This is something totally different. <laughs> but we have all these different things that we don't have in English. So what's the, what's the word in English for that? Put the mask on yourself first. You put, are you forsaking your children? No. They're, they're held in reserve. You're just taking care of yourself first so you can do a better job for them. So you forsake your children? No. You didn't forsake them. You understand the problem. We don't have a word for that. So, well, how come the Bible has some all these new words? By the way, when, when Tyndale did a translation, he brought 500 new words that never existed before. The word Jehovah, that's from him. It wasn't in the Latin. He's the one that brought forth the, the English equivalent of Jehovah. He brought it as Jehovah. And he's also the one that brought the word beautiful. How beautiful are the feet? He's the one that coined that. 500 new words that never existed before because there was nothing in English. Okay, is this all making sense? Just the, is, welcome to biblical research. Isn't it cool? I think it's exciting. All right, so if this is true, and if this is true or this is true, that's the commandment of God. Honor thy father and mother. So what's the deal? You need to take care of yourself first, then take care of them. What's that called in English? We don't have a word, but there is in Hebrew and Aramaic. Does that make sense now? Okay. Now, the question boils down to, what would you say is the proper trans... Now that I explained it all to you, what's that proper translation of Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani? Who has the answer? So I warned you, you're going to do biblical research today. Okay, well, my God, my God, my God, my God, right? That's pretty cool. Then, Lamana, right? Yes! Or, goal. He says goal. I don't know. <laughs> and, Shabbat Dani. Dani means my purpose or my cause. And, of course, for which I am left or reserved. You see how that works? Now you got to put it together and come up with a solution. See, you see how, how, how easy it is to be a translator? Uh, no, it's not. But what if it said something about that time and then as a place in the Bible? Would that be cool? Like maybe a prophecy about what Jesus would say. Would that be cool? And then, then see which one was right, whether it was this one or that one, right? So if it fits with this, wouldn't that be cool? What if it was Jesus who said what he's going to say at that time? Would that even be better? Everybody go like this, right? Because Jesus himself is going to say what he says he's going to do, right? So you want, you want to see it? All right. Here's what he says. He's going to say, when that time comes. John 12, 27. We're in the 12th. He's approaching the day of his, the month of his crucifixion. And he says, now is my soul troubled? And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. Does that fit this? Yes, it do. So what about this? That is to say, no, that crap was there to support the Roman Catholic Church's teachings. So there wouldn't be any conflict. I'm sorry. It's, uh, what's that? What do you call that stuff that the male cow leaves in the pasture? Manure? Okay, I have another word for it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This has nothing to do with the scriptures at all. Zero. 
I already showed you that. This is what this is what Jesus said he was going to say, and he says it. For this is my purpose. For this is the cause. This is what I'm reserved for. Got it? That he knew he was going to be crucified? Yeah, he kept saying, when this time comes, I'm going to be crucified. But what am I going to say? For this cause came out of As he's getting crucified, what's exactly what he says? Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani. And he dies. This is it. What the hell was he doing that for? So that you and I will be able to have access to God. Just as he did. Did he have sin on him? No. Do we have sin on us? Sin is not a thing. It's an absence of something. Remember I taught you the absence? The absence of something is not something. Right? The absence of something is not something. There's no such thing as a dark bulb. There's a light bulb, but there's no dark bulb. You don't plug it in and it gives you darkness. Darkness is the absence of what? You want more light, not more darkness. Or less darkness, you want more light. What's cold? It's the absence of what? Heat. What's sickness? The absence of what? Health. And that's exactly how the Bible explains it. We like to personify. My, my, my tank of my car is half filled. Right? Now my tank is filled with empty. No, empty is not a thing. <laughs> There's nothing there. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right. For this cause came out into this hour. Sin is not a thing. It's the absence of the knowledge of God. My people are destroyed for a lack of what? Knowledge. And that's why they're destroyed. A little child is not evil when they're three years old. You just got to watch them because they're going to do something stupid because they're ignorant. They, have a lack, they lack knowledge. They lack understanding. You got to watch them like a hawk. How many have a three-year-old that can just sit there and stay Leave them alone for a couple hours. No way. <laughs> Not unless you can tie them down to the ground. <laughs> right? you got to watch them like a hawk. Especially when I was three years old. Well, you had to watch me really good. Right? Well, I was quite crazy. Not that I'm not now, but that's beside the point. Okay. No laughing. All right. So, <laughs> okay, is that, are you blessed by that? You now, now you understand how to research the Word. Uh, each one of these things I showed you, look at where the same subject matter is written and what is expected, and then you know that Jesus did that. So wherever it's written on the same subject, you need to incorporate. And that's where this comes in. So this, what about this? That is to say, my God, is that in the Koine? Is that in the, in the Aramaic? No. Is it is in in the, in the, any Hebrew equivalent? No. Is it in the Sirach? No. So what do we do with this? Well, may I suggest this? Did that help? <laughs> it makes no sense. Why would they translate everything else except these four words? Because it would offend the Pope. Great. Because they've been teaching that Jesus had sin. Like that's not true. It's not true at all. Well, God forsook him because he had sin. <laughs> How many here sin within the first five minutes of waking up? You're supposed to agape God with all your heart, which leaves nothing else, all your soul, which leaves no more room for anything else, and all your mind, which means you can't think of anything else except from God's perspective. And we, we don't even wake up in the first five minutes without breaking the greatest commandment. You understand? So if he forsook Christ when he didn't, what do you think he's going to do with me? <laughs> like, I'm toast. <laughs> but it's not what the word says. We're called what? Children. A three-year-old is not evil. I'm sorry. Three-year-olds are not. They may act stupid. They may act ignorant. But they're not evil. They lack knowledge, wisdom, and what? How many of us act in a state of 
non-wisdom, non-understanding, and obviously don't know the whole time. That's why God doesn't call us my young adults. Uh, no, my teenagers. No, kicktonies he uses, which is a toddler, because we're just as bad as toddlers. Can't seem to, can't keep it together for 12 hours, not even six hours. Three, two, one. <laughs> Thank God that Jesus did what he did. <laughs> All right, so we're very blessed like that. Okay, now, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to revisit, remember what I told you about what happened, these were all previously what? Roman Catholics, right? And the king declares himself as equivalent to the pope in Rome, and formed a whole new religion on guess what verse? No. The king of England declared that he was equal to or superior to the pope. And he used this verse. So after the break, I'll show it to you. Let's break. All right. Now, what I'm about to get into is like, how is it, why did, when, when King Henry VIII kept, had made everybody read the Kramer Bible, everybody must read it, right? And... Everybody had, it was the law of the king to read the Bible so that they would not look at the Pope, but the Bible would be the center, which is pretty cool. But there's a part in there that's interestingly translated. I want to let you, I want you to tell me what happened. You ready? Okay. This is rather interesting. First of all, we're going to go into Romans 13. I want you to read it first. 14 verses. Just read it to yourselves. Then we're going to go over it together. But are you going to be shocked? Or maybe not. I don't know. Romans 13. Are you all enjoying this? Yes. Okay, good. That reassures me. <laughs> Let me know when you all read at least verse 8. Everybody read verse 8? Let me raise your hand when you read verse 8. Not just verse 8, I mean everything down to verse 8. Now, why did the king want everybody to read that? Right? You see the problem? So that proves that the king should be in charge and not the pope. That's how, he, that's how people interpreted it. And that justified the Anglican church with the king in charge and not the pope. Now I understand where I understand where Tyndale got it from because he specialized in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament you had kings and you had prophets. But that didn't apply after the day of Pentecost. Everything changed. But then again, you read this, you're like, wait a minute, that reverts back to the Old Testament. That doesn't make sense. Because then Assyria would be the god of the kingdom, because they conquered them. Or Babylon would be the, the conquering nation, therefore they're of God. So your problem with this? Now, Hitler used the same book. He used that same passages. Hitler. Germany, to convince all the Christians to come in, they couldn't. They should not resist him when he took them to the gas chambers. You understand the problem? And people willingly went to the gas chambers. Bonhomer rejected it, but Bonhomer wound up also in the gas chambers. When you're talking Bonhomer, right? So the question boils down to. What is the problem with people? What is the deal? And the thing is, we are, we have this orientation where we want someone else to take responsibility for our lives and not our own. 
And so long as that person has it, I don't have to worry about it. I've already taught you you're supposed to be what? Azir's. You're responsible for your own life first and then being able to take care of others. You don't do the reverse. Does that make sense? Because you're not going to be able to do your best unless you get your first, your own together. Speaking from personal experience, right? Now, let's, let's review this, okay? So he had the Kramer Bible printed and passed out. The Bible didn't pass out. He mean passed out to everybody in the kingdom. <laughs> so it states, let every soul be subject unto the what? Who just issued the commandment to read that? The king. So obviously it's talking about him, right? For there is no power but of God. So the king is put in position by God. The powers that be are ordained of God, so the king is ordained of God. Sharp cookie, huh? And that's why he was not, he would put himself on par with the Pope, and the people would go, this is what the Bible says, it's the word of God, so we're not listening to the Pope, we're going to listen to our king from now on. And it's really elaborate when you all read it. What would that tell you? That the king is God's representative on earth. That's what it appears to say, right? That's why the communist nations allow you to have a Bible. You can't have a church, but you can have a Bible. And it has to be that kind that's correctly translated. Now I'm going to translate this. I'm going to show you what's allowed in Russia and the Roman Catholic Church's Bible. So I'm going to read the Roman Catholic Church's Bible. Okay? This is the Roman Catholic Church's Bible. They have a Bible, by the way. It's just a, it's not very valuable. It's just on paper. They don't take really care. The, the priest, the pulpit Bible, though, is leather, and it's got the same pages, except they're better quality. And he reads that to the altar. There's only one part of the Bible he ever goes to. By the way, when they marry you, you know, not when you get married, when the, I now pronounce you man and wife thing. You know, you take this man to be a life with whatever husband they love him to cherish and to death do your part. She says, I do, that kind of stuff. There's a little piece of paper in there that he's reading. It's not from the Bible. Nowhere in this does it have that. Sorry. There's a little piece of paper he's reading. Nowhere in the Bible is the marriage vows. Not there. Because no one should be married unless they're committed to who? To God. If they're not both committed to God, they should not be married. The marriage vows is not for the man to the woman. It's the man to God concerning the woman. And the woman's vows aren't to him. The woman's vows are to God concerning him. See the difference? It's not the same. Different culture. All right. So I'm going to read to you the verse in Romans chapter 13. All right, this is from the Roman Catholic Church, and it reads as follows. Now, this Bible is allowed in Czechoslovakia. It's allowed in Russia. It's allowed in all the African nations, and you're probably wondering why. You must obey all the governing authorities, since all government comes from God. The civil authorities were appointed by God. And so anyone who resists the authority is rebelling against God's decision, and such an act is bound to be punished. Good behavior is not afraid of magistrates. Only criminals have anything to fear. If you want to live without being afraid of authority, you must live honestly, and authority may, have, may even honor you. The state is there to serve God for your benefit. If you break the law, however, you may well have Fear. The hearing, the bearing of the sword has its, its significance. The authorities are there to serve God. They carry out God's revenge by punishing wrongdoers. You must obey, therefore, not only because you are afraid of being punished, but also for conscience sake. This is also the reason why you pay taxes. And since all government officials are God's officers, they serve by God by collecting taxes. Pay every government official what is he has the right to ask, whether it be direct, tax, indirect, fear, or honor. Isn't that great? Wow. 
Only if you're in Texas. Tax <laughs> Isn't that sick? Now, how many of you ever heard of Billy Graham? Reach out to Jesus, right? As if he has an all in arm or something. Reach out to you. I'm touching you. Quit touching me. All right, anyway, in Romans chapter 13, in the Good News Bible by Billy Graham and Billy Bright. Yeah. Good news. Okay. Good news. All right. I mean, if you need some firewood, this does a really good job. Um, not good for anything else. Okay. Ah, everyone must obey the state authorities. Right off the bat. Because no authority exists without God's permission. Now you see why this Bible was able to be passed out where every Billy Graham went. Whether a communist country or a, or, or a terrorist, whoever he wanted to, he just passed these out. He always said, See, look, this is what I teach. They go, Oh, that sounds pretty good to me. Bring him in. Is this the word of God? No. Is there some word of God in there? It's hiding. Everyone must obey the state authorities. That must have worked really good under Hitler. Man. Or under any of the Roman emperors, like Nero. That must have worked really good. Everyone must obey state authorities because no authority is, exists without God's permission. That's not true. And existing authorities have been put there by God. That's not true either. Not according to the rest of the Bible. Whosoever that opposes the existing authority opposes what God has ordered. You smell it? It's bullshit. You can almost taste it. Uh -huh. And anyone who does not so brings judgment upon himself. For rulers are not to be feared by those who do good, but by those who do evil. Would you like to be unafraid of the man in authority? Then do what is good, and he will praise you because he's God's servant working for your own good. If you do evil, then be afraid because he has the power to punish his real. He's God's servant. Clinton is God's servant. Obama is God's servant. I have a hard time with that. He is God's servant and carries out God's punishment on those who do evil. For this reason, you must obey the authorities, not just because God's punishment, but also for a matter of conscience. That is why you pay your taxes, because the authorities are working for God when they fulfill their duties. Pay then what you owe them. Pay them your personal and property taxes. Show respect. I can't handle this anymore. All right, anyway. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the verse up here, and we're going to go through it. Now, I could cheat and use the Greek words, but I'm not, because it's not that hard, right? What happened? Well, you've got to understand, if you are the king, what are you going to try and do? Preserve your leadership. And the best leaders control what people believe. And if the, what they're giving them to see says the king is a representative of God and go against the king is going against God, what are you going to do? Got it? It's called propaganda, and it works real good. So, let every soul be subject unto the higher power. All right, higher powers. For there is no, there is no power but of God. What about the adversary? The Bible says he's the God of this world. So if the Bible says that, that the devil is the God of this world, and God has been pushed out, and God's trying to get back in, then all the power they be contradicts what this says because there is no power but of God. What about the adversary? Does the adversary have power? Yes. Well, then, then he's equal to God. No, he's not. See the problem. This makes you, this, the way this is phrased, it makes you think there's only one God. No, there's two. The God of this world and God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who is the God who fills all heaven and earth. 
Does that make sense? How many guys does the Bible talk? How many guys does the Bible talk about? Two. God put Adam in charge. Adam gave all his rights, authority, and power over to the devil, and that's how he wound up in charge. If he wants to start a hurricane, typhoon, disease, does it, and wipes out as many people as he can. He's the one behind the wars. He's the one behind destruction. Got it? That's when, when you're walking with God, you're protected. If you're not walking with God, then, you know. So, every soul be subject unto the higher powers. How, what higher powers? Well, there happens to be a verse. It says here that the higher powers are of God and they're ordained. Well, there's only one place where it names the higher powers that are ordained. Oh, I gave it away. Whoops. All right. All right, it's in Ephesians. It lists. It, li <laughs> it lists the ordained of God and their power, their authority. So, watch for the name King anywhere in this. Apostles, is that a king? No. Is it a magistrate? Nope. Is it anyone in the state or government? Nope. Well, how about this? Prophets. Is that the king? No. No, bullshit. <laughs> All right, if it's not the prophets, it's not apostles, maybe the king is an evangelist. No, no, he's not an evangelist. Oh, then the king's a pastor. No, he's not. I mean, do you see what he did here? Does that look like, you know, that's a barbecue in the worst way. Got it? How about teachers? No, King didn't teach anything. So, obviously, it doesn't say anything about kings, magistrates, state officials. It says apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Who are they? They're ordained of God. They are the higher powers of God on earth. That's it. Doesn't say king, doesn't say statesman, doesn't say governor, doesn't say magistrate, doesn't say policeman. By the way, the other Bible says policeman. They're all terrible. What are they for? The perfecting of the saints. Well, that doesn't look like very much like being perfected, right? But perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Well, how can you do that? With the word. What are they supposed to do? What do apostles do? Teach, help people learn. What do prophets do? Same thing. What does evangelists do? Same thing. Pastors, same thing. Teachers, what are they teaching? Carpentry? Masonry? No, they're teaching the what? Okay, that'll work. Everybody got that? This is the ordained of God. Can some of you be ordained of God? Yeah. Are they there yet? We'll find out. But some of you could be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Well, if you're a woman, it doesn't make a difference. The Old Testament is filled with women who are prophets. Does everybody understand? So, you, some of you may. Well, does that mean some of you are going to be kings? No. Some of you are going to be president? No, it has nothing to do with being administrative. State, local, government. It has nothing to do with that. It's only talking about the of God. Got it so far? Now we're going to make that disappear. I just want you to reference that. Ephesians 4, 12, 11, and 12. Wait, I forgot about it. Perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. What ministry? God's ministry. Why? Because the higher powers is part of the job of being ordained. For the edifying, the building up, getting bigger of the body of Christ. Now we can go like that. Okay. What about verse 2? Whosoever therefore resists the power. What power? The power and authority of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Resists the ordinances of God. God ordained them. Does it have anything to do with the king? No. Viceroy? No. Governor? No. Statesman? No. Policeman? No. That doesn't mean disrespectful to him, but that's not what this verse is talking about. And they that resist shall receive to themselves judgment. What, what, it doesn't say punishment. It says the word there is judgment. 
I could put this all in Greek and you'd say judgment. So in judgment, how do you know someone's wrong? Do I have a right to judge you? No. Do you have a right to judge me? No. But if I know the word, I know what the word says, and I say here, and you know what the word says, and you say, hey, Frank, right? It's the word that does the judging, not me, not him. I know you're cute, but not you either, okay? Nobody has the right to judge anybody. Huh? Only the word. Who said that? Oh, she did. Okay. Does that make sense? I always get kicked at people saying, well, you know what, this person and that person did this. And I go, I go, to share the word with them? Well, the, the word doesn't say anything about it. Then what the hell are you talking about? Keep your mouth shut. Yeah, I got it. No one has the right to talk about anyone else at all unless it's on the word. Otherwise, shut up. Want to complain about me? I'm all ears. But you better show me the word. Does that make sense? And the same thing with you. I'm not going to get any of you. You tell me what you do? I'm, it's your privilege. But when you're talking about the word, now we're talking about a different situation. Does that make sense? What you do in your personal life and what you do in your spare time, that's all between you and God. But when it happens, when you're talking about trying to, I'm here to make sure you're protected, you're kept, you, you have all the blessings you can possibly get. That's my job. What you do in your spare time or what you do in when, you, when no one's looking, that's between you and God. God sees that. I don't. And God's not going to show it to me. God's not going to show it to me, okay? He don't show that guy. God show me something, something bad about anyone in this room. He the, it probably hit me in the head. What are you talking about? God don't do that stuff. House. Imagine having a little three-year-old. He's trying to learn how to walk. You stupid fool! When are you going to learn how to walk? You know, come on. He's only a three-year-old. Give him a chance. Freaking, I can't get on each other's case. It doesn't work like that. Don't find fault with one another. I got, I got, I got news for you. It's not God that's telling you these things. God's not directing you. <sighs> Whosoever therefore resists the power, the authority of the word that they have. Resist is the ordinance of God, and they resist shall receive to themselves judgment. This is what the word says. Again, what are we talking about? The ordained of God. These are higher powers. It has the thoughts and images of God. It ain't the king. Romans 13, 3 and 4. For rulers, what rulers? Ordained of God, higher powers. Ordained of God. <laughs> Not once, twice are not a tear to good works. Well, how about the king? Is he a tear to good works? Um, yeah. It's not talking about a king. Not talking about magistrates, not talking about legal people, not talking about the government, talking about those who are ordained of God. I have no idea which one of you are going to be ordained. Or God's already ordained you. I have no idea yet. I'm just waiting for signs. Not stop, yield. I'm talking about indications. How many are terrified when you see me? <laughs> I know. <that's> like <laughs> Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Uh, what's, what's evil? Going by your own intellect, what? And not the word. How am I a terror to that? You see the problem? That doesn't, Jesus was never a terror to anybody. The Apostle Paul was never a terror to anybody. The translational errors are compounded here. <laughs> Will thou then not be afraid? The word afraid is uh, as honor, respectful. For the power, do that which is good. What's good? Fulfilling the word of God. And thou shalt have praise of the same. Again, who is this person? Is it a, a legal man? Is it a lawyer? Is it a doctor? Is it a government official? Is it a statesman? Congressman? Is it the king? No. He is a minister of who? What are the ministers? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. How many are there? Five. That's it. There's only five gift ministries. Where are they? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. All right. Let's do it backwards. No, I'm just joking. For he's the minister of God to thee for what? 
What's good? Fulfilling the what? The word. Is that the king? Is that the policeman? No, they don't know the word. What are you talking about? But do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword. Ha ha! Have you seen my sword lately? <laughs> What's it talking about? Because if you're of God, you've got to be bearing your sword. So obviously it's not talking about men of God. It's talking about the policeman. Because he got a gun. A gun's not a sword. Come on. What are we talking about? So what's a sword? Minister of God. Ephesians 6, 7. And take the helmet of salvation and the what? What's the sword of the Spirit? You have excellent vision, sir. I have no idea what's wrong with everybody else, but you have excellent vision. Okay. All right, ready? We're all going to read it together. This is Ephesians 6.17. We want to know what's the sword this guy's carrying. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There you go. So do I carry the Word of God? My sword has been well used. Right? Okay, now let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. There you go. Again. And Jesus again mentions it in the gospel. So, I mean, several places. Psalms, another one. But nonetheless, these two should be sufficient because it's very blatant. So, he beareth not the sword, the word of God. For, you see, minister to God for thee for good, doing, fulfilling God's word. That which is good, doing and fulfilling God's word. A terror, not a terror to good works, doing, fulfilling God's word. So, what's the sword? The word of God. Is, is this complicated? No. What's the problem? That people have the wrong image. And it's deliberately translated to orientate your perspective to where the king and the magistrates are ordained of God. And thus forms the Anglican religion. Because the holiest woman on earth was Queen Elizabeth. Isn't that weird? What's the term for that? It's called propaganda. Deliberate propaganda. And bad translations. So, when Martin Luther declared at the at the uh, court of Worms when they were going to kill him, he declared "Scriptura sacra sui ipsuis interpres." Yes, it's Latin. It's not German. At that time, all, all academics wrote and spoke in Latin. Even though they were German or French, everybody, all academics had the same language, which was Latin. Got it? So that's why my books I got from the 16th century, they're all in what? Latin. Now, ecclesiastical Latin is different from classical Latin. It's kind of difficult sometimes because of what they do, the letters and how they arrange them. But, you know, it's a little practice. Grab my other books and I have no idea what that says. <laughs> Look it up. All right, you're going to learn some Latin today. Ready? Are you Latinos? <laughs> you're going to be called Latinos. You better learn some Latin. <laughs> Who knows Latin? Latinos do, right? That's the motto of Ebros. Scriptura sacra, suis ipsuis interpres. Oh! Love it. Right? All together now. Go! All right. Give yourselves a big hand. That was awesome. So notice you've been learning how to do research. I taught you how to work within the word to interpret itself. And I even gave you some Latin. Yeah. Now you can truly say that you are real Latinos, right? All right. Yes. 
Oh my gosh, yeah, what's that? You didn't know what it means. I forgot to tell you. What do you think it says? Uh, come on. Scriptura, scripture, holy, sacra, holy, sui, ipsuis, interpres. Isn't that cool? So I think you've all been there. How many had a really good time? Isn't that great? I, I love it. <laughs> this is stuff. I eat this stuff for breakfast and lunch and dinner and even before I go to bed, even when I wake up. I love this stuff. So now I get to share it with you. And you see, it's not that hard. This isn't. So. And of course, always trust the king. The king is God's minister, right? No, I don't think so. Challenges of translation. Okay? I'll give you this as a hand. That was a hand. Yeah. Gracias, Padre, por su bendecido sobre todos nosotros para ayudar a nosotros a entender su palabra y conocer su corazón para caminar contigo en su sobra y su bendecido sobre nuestra vida. Que nosotros la doy gloria a usted como tu primigenito. Vaso Salvador Jesus, su ungido. All righty. How's my Spanish, huh? Voy a hablar español como mexicano. Okay. All together now. All together now. Ready? <laughs> you are God's what? Best. Best. I love you. <laughs>